From the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV and the Danforth Center are proud to present Conversations, a discussion about Missouri prairies and native plants, the science of our natural landscape. Thank you for coming. I'm Molly Klein, and I'm chair of the Conversation Committee. And I am very pleased um, and proud as a plant scientist uh, to welcome you to the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. We have a real treasure right here in St. Louis, a world-class plant science institute dedicated with the mission of improving people's lives and health and feeding the hungry, improving health again, preserving and renewing our environment, and enhancing our St. Louis region as the world center for plant science. And you know what? That is absolutely true. Again, the treasure right here in St. Louis. And it's a real honor um, before we get in, yeah. It's a real honor uh, to ask Dr. Uh, Bill Danforth to come to the podium, and he's going to give some remarks before we get into our program uh, topic at hand, and he's the founding chairman of the Plant Science Center. Thanks, Molly, very much, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we have uh, more people coming than we've ever had before, as some of you will have noticed. Uh, I just want to make a few remarks in advance. Today is the 42nd of the conversation series in the 11-year history of our Plant Science Center. The program began small and is now our signature event. The number coming has grown from 55 to today's number, which may be as high as 370 plus. And <clears throat> that is thanks to interesting participants and our leader and regular moderator, the skilled, always prepared Professor Jim Davis, who is in a part-time job, I guess, a faculty member at Washington U. He always zeroes in on the most interesting aspects of any subject and does so with humor and kindness that brings out the best in every speaker. More than anyone else, Jim has created and brought success to this program as, as a, uh, a great educator can do as he has with everything he's touched that I've ever seen. Now, as happened to all of us, there comes a time to retire and pass responsibilities on to younger folk. My own retirements have been, <laughs> have been a joy, probably because I've realized that able younger folk will carry on bringing their generational insights and sensibilities to the causes that I have valued. So Jim is retiring as leader of this conversation series. So this is our opportunity to say thank you and to leave a permanent reminder of our admiration and gratitude. From henceforth, this stage that Jim has graced and made memorable will carry the name of our beloved, talented, and remarkable James W. Davis, and there will be a plaque, and I think it's up here. It just appeared. <laughs> the wording on the plaque, the James W. Davis stage, in sincere appreciation for leading the conversation about plant science. August 28th, 2014. So Jim, 
thank you from the bottom of my heart, from all your friends and admirers. And uh, Jim, will you just stand? <laughs> Jim, but before you sit down, I know you'd feel more properly honored if your family were standing with you. Your bride and life partner, Jean. <laughs> Son, Warren, an assistant dean at Washington University. And his wife, Reverend Emily Davis. <laughs> Daughter Claire and her husband, David Obedin. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we're just a little way of expressing our appreciation. Well, I'm delighted. Thank you so much. I always thought I was a professor. Now I know I'm an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Danforth, and uh, congratulations again, uh, Dr. Davis. Well, tonight we're going to talk about Missouri prairies and native plants, the science of our natural landscape. I'll tell you, with this hot weather that we've been having, um, I've been trying to imagine how those little prairie gra grasses maybe danced if there was ever a breeze, but also thinking, and I think we all will after tonight's conversation, think about how important those plants are and the genetic information that they contain regards to how plants tolerate uh, heat uh, and drought and, and so forth. And there might be something else that you might ponder, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tony Kuchan. Yes, Tony, are you in the room? Yeah, there you are. Um, she shared a very interesting quote with me. Uh, what is a weed? So when we are thinking about these grasses and native plants, it's a plant whose virtues are not yet discovered. <laughs> okay, and that's from Emerson. Thank you, Dr. Kuchan. Um, at this time, um, could I ask our um, moderator and our um, distinguished panelists to come up uh, to the stage, and I'll introduce them. So our moderator uh, for this evening is Vijay Chowan, and he's entrepreneur in residence at Biogenerator, uh, Vijay. And our distinguished panelists are uh, Scott Woodbury, Scott, who's a curator of the Whitmer Wildflower Garden at Shaw Nature Reserve. <laughs> and Dr. Toby Kellogg, who's a member of the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. So Vijay and, and panelists, take it away. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is an incredibly frightening experience for me to be, <laughs> sitting, to be sitting in this chair when Dr. Jim Davis is right in front of me. So I am not even going to pretend to be sitting in anybody's shoes. I'm going to be just barefoot. <laughs> I'll keep my shoes on. And I'm going to work on building my own shoes to fill. <laughs> so we have a very exciting talk tonight. Uh, I had an opportunity to spend time with uh, Scott and Toby before the talk and to hear them go through what they are doing, their life's passion, their work. It was just a blur. 
And when I sat down, I said, you know, I think I know what the summary of all of this is. It's about grass and weeds and birds and bees. <laughs> and plant science. I think those are ingredients for a fantastic conversation. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. So we have, don't have that much time, so let's get to it. And I want to start with you, Scott. Tell us about Shaw Natural Reserve and your role as a curator there. Shaw Nature Reserve is um, 35 miles west of St. Louis. It is a part of Missouri Botanical Garden. Some people may not know that. Uh, we have 2,400 acres of uh, reconstructed and restored prairie and woodland and savanna and wetlands, uh, 14 miles of hiking trails, and a lovely garden um, that was a gift uh, by Blanton and Peg Whitmire to the community. So I welcome you all to come out, if you can, to see this beautiful garden. Uh, even at 100 degrees, it's looking s spectacular right now. Um, and so my, uh, my job has been, uh, since 1991, to develop the, the Whitmer Wildflower Garden and to bring it to the community, uh, to provide educational opportunities in the garden, in this natural classroom, for people to come and enjoy and to learn about native plants and native landscaping. Well, that's just the teaser. You'll, watch, you'll learn a lot more about his fascinating work in a second. So Toby, I want to ask you, tell us a little bit about your research interest in grass and cereal crops. So I study grasses in general. That if basically you think of Scott looking at the landscape, I look at the individual plants. But I think of them as a whole group. That is, we think about corn and sorghum and the crop plants that we all eat and as, as being nutritious, but we don't often think that they're actually part of a, a large group of about 12,000 species of grass. And the really important ones ecologically, of course, are the ones of the prairie, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. They are all very, very closely related. The genes are very similar, and that means that whatever we learn about the crops, we can apply to the prairie grasses. And whatever we learn about the prairie grasses, we can apply to the crops. And so it gives you this sort of two-way street of information. The genetics is so similar that each one can build on, on the other. So I, I study how the plants produce seeds. Um, so the seeds, of course, come from flowers. So I study a lot about how many flowers a plant produces and what are the genes that control that. I study photosynthesis which if you think about seeds as, of course, being carbohydrates, the carbo part of that is carbon, right, like carbon dioxide out of the air. So I'm looking at how that carbon gets into the seed. Um, and studying that for improving the ecological success of the prairie grasses and then also the yield potential in crops so that the two work together. Thank you. So behind us, we have a spectacular illustration. And Scott, can you tell us what this is? What's so special about it? Well, this is a, an artist uh, rendering of what the tall grass uh, landscape looked like um, at the time of early settlement. Um, it was um, drawn by Paul Nelson. Um, and uh, it appears in the tall grass restoration handbook, which is a, a terrific volume if you want to learn about uh, restoring tall grass prairies and everything that's involved uh, from start to finish. It's a collaboration of uh, minds and a really great uh, resource. Um, but because nobody was photographing the tall grass landscape in the early 1800s, uh, we're left with imagination of what it looked like that basically is drawn from some of the early settlers, some of the early um, people who studied the landscape. And I just wanted to read a couple um, passages from two Henrys, Henry Shaw, who was the founder of Missouri Botanical Garden, and Henry Schoolcraft, who was a geologist that walked across Missouri down into Arkansas, starting from Potosi, Missouri, which is about an hour and a half southwest uh, of here, um, and crossed the Ozark Territory down into, uh, into Arkansas. So I'll start with Henry Schoolcraft. Um, and imagine today the Mark Twain National Forest being this completely closed canopy. I'm sure you've driven through it. You've seen uh, what it looks like today. Um, in 1818, 
uh, Schoolcraft wrote, for the first four miles lay across a succession of sterile ridges, thinly covered with oaks. When we suddenly descended into the valley of the Merrimack, having extensive prairies along its bank, one of the greatest inconveniences we experience, having been compelled to stop in an open prairie, arises from the difficulty of finding wood and water. <laughs> Pretty hard to believe. And then Henry Shaw, I think equally hard to believe, um, wrote um, about his first encounter with the grounds at Missouri Botanical Garden in uh, 1820. And he wrote, um, the grounds were called the Prairie at Denoyer Fence. Louis Denoyer formerly lived at and kept the gate of the fence by which the commons of the old village of St. Louis was surrounded. For a distance of nearly two miles from where Tower Grove Park is now laid out to Taylorwick Station, no trees were growing except two or three venerable cottonwoods in the low ground. The prairie was grown over with tall, natural prairie grass and he wrote Andropogon, but I don't know which species. It could have been any number of species or a number of couple species, with an occasional patch of wild strawberry. Uh, the landscape clearly um, is quite different. Uh, it's a landscape that um, was made by man through the use of fire, and in the absence of fire has grown into the Mark Twain National Forest that we see today. Very, very different landscape. Very good. Thank you about that, Scott. So, Toby, tell us from a researcher for studying grass and grasses and cereal crops, why should we care about prairie grass? Why should you not care about prairie grass? <laughs> <laughs> it is the dominant landscape in this part of Missouri. And maybe, Vijay, if we could switch over to the, that next slide. This is the distribution of the tall grass prairie in Missouri pre-settlement. So this is a map that was produced by the Missouri Prairie Foundation and gives you some idea of the extent of that landscape. So, and as Scott said, it's maintained by fire. There's this sort of active boundary between forests and prairie. And if, it's, if you burn it, it'll stay as prairie. And if you don't, then the, the forest comes back in. The prairie grasses are tremendous sources of stability for, for, and habitat for an awful lot of organisms. I think one of the things that we should be aware of right now is their root system. That is, they take carbon, I mentioned that carbon, as in carbohydrate, coming out of the air, carbon dioxide, is taken out of the air and they put it below ground. So you hear all sorts of things in the news about sequestering carbon. Well, the prairie plants have been doing that for millions of years. We don't need fancy technical things to pump the carbon dioxide below ground. They're just doing it all the time. They have phenomenal roots. I don't know if you noticed the, the grasses that were sitting out there in the atrium when you, when you came in. Uh, one of those is a big blue stem, but it is a very little bl big blue stem, and that's because it's in a very small pot. If we put it in a bigger pot, it would, the roots would just fill the pot and it would get, I mean, I'd have to just keep moving to bigger and bigger pots. So the, the prairie grasses are the soil builders. They're, they're the things that created the tremendous soil on which we are now growing corn. And in fact, the challenge for the early settlers was to plow up that soil. They needed the steel plows. It wasn't until you had really good plows that you could even plant this. And so that much of what is now the Missouri corn crop is growing on areas that had been prairie grasses, also relatives of corn. And they're the ones that had made such a great soil base. So, so I think that's probably one of the, the most exciting things about them is just what they do for the soil. So Scott, as custodians of the planet, why should we care about prairie grass? Well, um, Prairie plants were so successful at creating great soil that we came in and grew our crops on those areas um, to the extent that we only have in Missouri about one-tenth of one percent of tall grass prairie left. Um, some adjoining states that have extensive or used to have extensive tall grass prairies 
um, have even less than one tenth of one percent left. Um, if we look at the at the nation, the lower 48 as a whole, um, about 40 percent of the of the lower 48 states um, is in agriculture. About 55 percent of it in cities and suburbs, and that leaves about five percent of the of the of the land area left in. Um, relatively undisturbed natural um, plant communities. Um, that's not a whole lot to, um, to have left. Um, we don't have too many opportunities um, with that kind of pressure on the landscape. And so I think that um, part of the message that I bring as a horticulturist is that we have an opportunity on that 55% of the land that is in our communities uh, in our cities, on the property here at the Danforth Plant Science Center, to begin to introduce some of these native species that used to be here. I think that's our challenge. Right. And if I, I could jump in just briefly, many of you saw, have seen the construction out here. Some of the new landscaping will indeed be, be prairie, and that's being planted in, in conjunction with, with advice from Scott and, and Laurel Harrington. So that that's, that's part of the, the plan for what this site is going to look like, is a, is a restored prairie. So Toby, we've got these fantastic agricultural production engines called corn and soybean and rice and wheat, and all these are feeding the world. Why should we be researching grasses? What can they do for solving the big problems we have about feeding this hungry planet? Because they're all so connected. What you learn about one, you learn about another. So another aspect of the prairie plants is that they are extraordinarily drought tolerant. Um, that they'll, they'll put up with amazing things. And a couple of years ago when we had that really bad hot summer, which for those of us from New England was really pretty miserable, um, <laughs> the, the prairie plants did just fine. They weren't very tall. I mean, they, they definitely grow taller than you know, when they get more water, but they, they made it through. There wasn't any question of losing the prairie plants. And so the question is, how do they do that? Just mechanically, what's the genetic basis of a plant being able to put up with that kind of abuse? If we can understand that in the prairie plants, they are so similar to corn and sorghum, then that understanding can be translated directly we can look, go look at those same genes for levels of variation and start thinking about how to use it to improve germplasm and improve breeding. So Toby, you just came to the Danforth Center like last year, or yes. earlier this year. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you were doing before and having come here, what's been the impact on your research? So, um, so before, I, was, I spent 15 years at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, where I was the uh, E. Desmond Lee and Family Professor of Botanical Studies formally linking the Botanical Garden and the University of Missouri St. Louis. And so I provided the molecular lab for the Botanical Garden. And working together with my husband, Peter Stevens, uh, we have trained a very large number of graduate students who come in through the Botanical Garden from all over the world um, and to do their, their studies at UMSL. Uh, in January, I moved here. Um, had just the opportunity to change from one great institution to another. And it's, I, I feel like a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> it's just a really fabulous intellectual environment of just a lot of new opportunities, a lot of new people to talk to. It's the, the other members here are superb and have just lots of new ideas and very open to themselves, open to new kinds of collaborations. <laughs> Great. So having fun here. Yes, absolutely. I, I don't know if I should talk about some of the new stuff I'm doing absolutely. Or, or, or what. Uh, I, I've been doing a new set of experiments this week, which might be worth talking about just because it's so illustrative about how science actually operates. In that I was chatting with Paul Anderson, who is the director he, here, the director of the International Center, um, the, the group that, that focuses on international crop improvement. I was chatting with him about problems of pests, insect pests on sorghum, particularly in Africa. And they're developing insect-resistant lines in sorghum. And I immediately got thinking, well, 
a lot of the grasses that I work on are closely related to sorghum, and they also grow in Africa, and they also get eaten by insects, but they're not wiped out, and that means they must be resistant. So we've just started a very preliminary set of experiments, which I probably shouldn't be talking about, but they're so fun, is that <laughs> where we've just taken, I've got about 80 different species of grasses, including the big prairie grasses here, and then the big grassland plants from Africa, all growing out here in the greenhouse, and we're just doing a whole bunch of feeding trials with insects. And we, so we've got a bunch of bugs, and we just feed the plants to the bugs. And, and the question is, you know, are there, perhaps is there a genetic basis for insect resistance in there? And the, the results from three days worth of experiments is <laughs> that there are some of these plants that the insects really, really hate. You know, they just really don't like it. And that's a clue. That's saying there's something there that's worth following up. And that would not have started without being here, without the resources here. I'm uh, working with Paul's postdoc, Bala Venkata, who's just a very experienced entomologist and looking at plant resistance. And the hope is that, well, obviously, the first thing is that we're going to repeat the experiment. Uh, but, the hope is that we can then go farther with that and figure out why it is the insects hate it. And perhaps that information then can then be translated to the crops. If it's a chemical compound, I'm certainly going to be knocking on Tony Kutchen's store, asking her for her chemical expertise. Um, yeah, I'm certainly going to be knocking on the door of Brad Evans, who runs the mass spec facility, to tell me what these chemicals are. The, the resources are here for just starting that kind of completely new experiment that may have the opportunity then to help with sustainability of agriculture, both in Africa and here in Missouri. Great. So Scott, one of the things I found really fascinating in our uh, preparation discussion was the significant linkage between native plants, prairie grasses, the herbivores, and then the birds. Can you explain to the audience what that precious ecosystem is and what's at risk today in the way we live and develop our communities? Sure. Um, Vijay, perhaps the, the easiest way to describe this is to ask you a question or two. <laughs> and um, the first thing that comes to mind is, do you know how many caterpillars it takes to feed a nest of chickadees? I need help. <laughs> Anybody? 4,800. 4, you read it in there. <laughs> That's good. It's about 5,000 caterpillars. Um, and so question number two is, where do those 5,000 caterpillars come from? Ask her. She probably, <laughs> anybody else? If not, we'll defer to the lady with the handout. <laughs> Really, where do 5,000 caterpillars come from? Where it come from at least, uh, uh, at least butterflies. 1,000 butterflies and moths. Butterflies and moths. The, 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 the insect group, um, the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and the moths are the primary um, food source for uh, chickadees. The, this was a, a, an informal study that um, author Doug Tallamy did out his kitchen window. And he was observing chickadees feeding their young and saw that they were feeding them about 300 caterpillars a day. And it had amounted to over 5,000 caterpillars over the life of that clutch. And um, so when I think about the habitat that, we, um, that is missing, um, the very small amount of native plant communities that we have um, in our lives, um, and I think about how we are, as a society, going to feed a chickadee, tens of thousands of chickadees, and all of the species that seem to be in decline. It's not just birds, amphibians, mammals, reptiles, fish, you name it. There are so many species that are in decline because of this problem that we've created for ourselves or for wildlife. Um, I think, like Doug Tallamy does, that we have, and perhaps our greatest opportunity, to turn this problem around 
is with that 55% of the suburbs, the cities, the communities that we live in, the communities that we learn in, the places that we worship in, the places we go to work in, the places where we are raising our families. And, um, and lo and behold, when you start to look at the plants that are feeding these caterpillars, um, so we know what the birds are eating, but what are the caterpillars eating? When you start to look at that, um, how many caterpillars are eating hostas? How many caterpillars are eating daylilies? How many caterpillars are feeding on turf grass? There's not a lot of activity going on in those areas. But when you start to look at, like Doug Tallamy and some of his, um, all of his army of graduate students that did the on the ground counting, um, they started to realize that there are 112 species of caterpillars that have specific relationships with the group of asters, which is a plant, by the way, that's very beautiful. It's one of the best ways to provide nectar for monarch butterflies in a garden. Um, he and his associates found that oak trees provide uh, food for 560 species of caterpillars, of butterflies and moths. Um, that goldenrods have about 113 species to date. Um, this research is so new, and there are so few people um, that are looking into this um, at the moment that we really don't know um, the extent of all of the plants um, that we garden with, all the plants that once existed in our prairies and wetlands and woodlands and savannas. Um, but we do know that it's very clear that um, there is a, a distinct relationship between the plants that we bring into our landscape and the potential for creating 5,000 caterpillars to feed um, a clutch of baby birds. And so I do ask um, VJ that um, we should perhaps be asking how we can produce 5,000 caterpillars rather than as we have as a society in the past figure out how we can kill 5,000 caterpillars in our garden. <laughs> there you go, well done. So I wanted to give an opportunity to talk about a very progressive uh, institution here that has taken on a approach that you are talking about. And here's a picture behind us that talks to it. Scott, can you tell us what's behind us? And Sure, uh, this is um, the Alberici Group. This is the world headquarters for Alberici. Um, and uh, on the left is an image of um, the construction site. And on the right is an image that uh, was taken five years later. Um, there was another image that I thought about putting into, into here, and that is the in-between. And, um, and so what Alberici decided to do was develop a natural landscape. Um, they have very little turf in their landscape. Um, Compared to their original headquarters landscape, which had a lot of turf, a lot of traditional landscaping, and a $50,000 landscape bill. <laughs> and um, long story short, this very natural landscape that does very good things for the environment, it takes care of stormwater in appropriate ways. Stormwater has never left the property, for example. They have a wind generating uh, tower that produces 11% of their electrical needs. Um, this, uh, this landscape now costs them about um, half that to, um, to operate. So there's a cost savings there. And there uh, not only is uh, a cost savings, but there is um, uh, evidence on the grounds that this newly created, reconstructed prairie and wetland environment is providing habitat for all sorts of um, organisms that um, people that walk around on the trails um, are appreciating, uh, including John Alberici, who is the number one proponent of this, of this whole thing. Now, that middle image that I didn't show you um, is the picture of um, weediness. I assume from uh, the lack of tomatoes in the audience that um, you are on board, perhaps, with the thought of using native plants and using prairie plants in the landscape. Um, that's good, because at the Danforth Center, the prairie landscape that you see in the photographs today may be what it will look like after a few years. Um, 
and I, I spoke to Laurel about this so many times. Um, but in the first year, it's going to be a weed patch. The prairie seedlings will be small, the weeds will be tall and vigorous, and will try to take over all of the prairie seedlings. There'll be this battle going on. And um, the method um, that we use to try to create control in this environment is uh, mowing. And so, um, so for the first year, you're going to be looking at somebody out there mowing down the weeds. And for the second year, that may be what you're looking, that you're looking at as well. But hopefully by year three, which is normally the case, um, the prairie plants will be big enough. They'll have huge root systems um, that will be aggressive enough to push out any of the weed plants um, that uh, existed in year one and year two. So perception is um, important. Patience is important. Bringing people along um, who may not understand the process is very important. And so um, your PR department is going to be very busy over the next few years. <laughs> and they will begin to breathe easy. I guarantee those of you in the PR department are going to begin to breathe easy after year three. So Scott, you've already started to get some converts here. And people are asking, where can I get prairie grass seeds to change our backyard? I think this is what you want to hear. Sure. Uh, prairie seeds for the backyard. Um, well, it could go in the front yard, too, I suppose. <laughs> it's a start. Be careful if you do that. Um, prairie seeds are available at a wide array of nurseries throughout the Midwest. Uh, if you live in Missouri, um, there are some great options for buying local ecotype prairie seeds. Um, and there's, uh, you know, I'll probably miss a few, but the ones that are in our region and the St. Louis region include um, Pure Air Native Seeds, which is a part of DJM Ecological Services, um, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. There's a small outfit, a retired math teacher over in Illinois who runs Blue Stem Prairie Farm, uh, or sorry, um, uh, pr uh, yeah, Blue Stem Prairie Farm, Blue Stem Prairie, Prairie Nursery and he sells little packets of, uh, of things. Or you could come out to Shaw Nature Reserve because we sell small packets of prairie seeds as well. And um, I will put a plug into our Shaw Wildflower Market, which is September 5th. It's coming right up. And uh, um, Pure Air Native Seeds will be selling seeds um, at our Shaw Wildflower Market Friday, September 5th uh, from 4 to 7.30. Very good. So Toby, people want to know, where else besides the United States does prairie grass grow elsewhere in the world? Are there any dominant regions? So if it's not called prairie, but they're very similar groups of plants. If you've watched Wild Kingdom, right, the Serengeti, the big African grasslands are dominated by many of the same genera. They're different species, but the, the genera are the same. So it'll be Andropogon, Schizocarium, for those of you who are familiar with those, are all over. The, the main African grasslands are also the same group of species. And then Australian grasslands. Some parts of Brazil, um, the, the Cerrado in Brazil, is also dominated, dominated by the same group. So the name of the vegetation is different. The name is local. It's prairie refers usually just to North America. But if you think about just the, the whole constellation of species, it's Africa, Australia, and South America. So s folks want to know, uh, the, they read an article in the Post-Dispatch about the declining population of the monarch but butterflies. And they wondered if uh, landscape devoted to prairie grass would help in any way. Absolutely. Um, I was tempted for many years to develop a butterfly garden um, at the Whitmire Garden years ago. And I always looked at all of our native landscapes, the prairie, the woodland, um, the wetland, um, as butterfly gardens themselves. They're full of native species that um, support native uh, Lepidoptera species. And so um, tallgrass prairie is a perfect um, example of a butterfly garden. And um, not only um, will this landscape have um, milkweed plants that have 
a direct correlation to monarch butterflies. Monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed plants, and that is a part of their life cycle. Um, but all of the other species in the prairie will work to, um, to support the monarch butterfly. They'll be getting nectar off of goldenrods and asters at a very critical time when they're beginning their migration back down to a very remote area in um, near Mexico City. How they know how to get to Mexico City, I'll never know, because <laughs> they will have just hatched out within a month or two prior. So uh, it's one of the great mysteries of the world. Um, but uh, these plants in this landscape will benefit monarchs and other butterfly and moth species. So Toby, if things go really, really great in your research program, what is sort of your biggest hope and hope, biggest dream for what will come out of it? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I would love to be able to find some genetic pathway in prairie grasses that turns out to be present, but perhaps not active in the crops, where we could point to it and say, let's find a way to activate that pathway, and it'll either improve drought tolerance or improve yield, or maybe both, I mean, since I'm fantasizing here. Um, so that, the, that to be able to, to do that full translation from the wild plant that is so good at fixing carbon and withstanding drought and putting up with insects, to translate that into a crop where it can also benefit humanity. I think that would be fabulous. Great. And Scott, if you could change our view of lawn, these beautifully manicured lawns that have a huge negative environmental impact, and look at that as not as attractive as prairie grass, how would you go about doing it? Well, I wouldn't start by removing all of it. <laughs> <laughs> That ends in disaster most often. Um, but I might consider um, a reduction of turf grass. Um, maybe start with a 20% reduction of turf grass. Uh, we have 40 million acres of turf grass in America, uh, which is larger than any single crop. It's larger than all of the national parks combined. Um, it's a trend that we need to start turning around. Um, and tall grass prairies are probably one of um, the best ways to, to do that. Right, Chan? Um, in the front yard, sometimes it's appropriate. Um, in the backyard, it uh, may be appropriate. Um, we have to do it in ways that uh, work into our communities. Because if you were to develop a tall grass prairie in your entire front yard, you would have somebody knocking on your door very quickly. <laughs> Um, writing your ticket. Um, but, if, but there are ways to develop a landscape um, using tall grass plants, um, having pathways, having benches, encouraging ways for people to interact with these landscapes. Sculpture is a wonderful thing to add to, um, to tall grass landscapes. Um, signs are oftentimes necessary. I know somebody who stuck a sign in their yard that said, this garden won the 2009 Landscape Challenge Award for the, they made it up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a sign that said that this landscape was intentional. Um, and we forget that um, because these landscapes look so different from what we see in our communities right now. We don't want things that are drastically different than uh, the communities that we see right now. I would venture to say that, um, because I don't see any tomatoes in your hands, that um, you might accept a tall grass landscape in your community. Um, but I would venture to say that 90% of our society doesn't get that. And so small steps are really critical. Um, adding a few native plants into a garden mixed with non-native plants is a great way um, to get uh, started with some plants that can provide benefit to the wildlife in our communities. We don't have to rip out our existing gardens, um, but we can start adding a few things to our landscapes, and we can continue this conversation. Um, I think that's, um, 
a goal that we all can uh, go home with. And come out to the Shaw Wildflower Market on September 5th, and you can start your journey. <laughs> <laughs> and as I think about what that journey looks, the destination of that journey looks like, it's the picture behind me. It's the one that I think Scott would find enormous satisfaction to see. And Toby, as a scientist, as a plant scientist, would also find tremendous satisfaction. And this is where you see the intersection of science and conservation. Right here, two people, two different fields, common destiny, common destination. So that's what I take away from this talk tonight. I hope you have enjoyed it. And with that, I want to say thank you for coming and look forward to another conversation in the future. Jim, thank you for setting the stage for a successful conversation series. We hope to continue that and fill your big shoes in some shape or form. You have been wonderful tonight, and the conversation must have been very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank BJ and the panel for a wonderful presentation, wonderful discussion. Thanks to you all for coming. The only comment that I thought of uh, that I could make while I was listening to this was, it's hard for most of us who aren't engaged in these fields to realize how fast things move and how much of what we heard probably would not have been known 15 years ago. Is that true? Mm -hmm. exactly right. sure. At least it wouldn't have been put together this way. Yeah. And uh, that's what we humans are. We're learning animals, learning machines. And we'll have to keep at it and keep young people going and new things coming along because there's so much yet, yet to learn, so much we don't know. So um, let's just keep at it. Thank you very Thank you. much.